Excited to get into the Word today. At the beginning of this year, Pastor Daniel and I sat down, talked about different themes that we felt the Lord was impressing us to speak on. He's doing a series on worship, and I started out wanting to do something in the area of revival and reformation. I'm telling you that because I feel like the Lord has really been moving in our community, uh, I think for some time, but even just this last week, we shared with you when we had our Gloss students up here, we did our, our uh, Army of Youth training, that the Lord has really been challenging us. And the Lord has been challenging us here in our school, in our personal lives, uh, in our students' lives. And I think the message that I had planned before this happened is the Lord's doing. I think as we get into the Word today, I really hope that we listen to the Spirit's voice to speak to us. Do you think the Spirit of God has something to say to you today? I know He has something to say to me today, so let's pray and ask and invite His presence. Bow your heads with me as I kneel, please. Father in heaven, oh Father, we are thankful to be in your house, but Lord, being here in just being here in body is not the same as being here to listen and to be guided to follow where you would lead us. So I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to respond to your word. Uh, Father, enlighten our understanding and draw us close to yourself. And Father, I pray you would help us to be willing to remove anything that holds us apart from you today. For we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message today is Tearing Down the High Places. Now, a study in the scripture of the high places will reveal that while there was a time where the Lord was worshipped in high places, and this usually referred to a place that would obviously be a higher elevation and a place where they would worship out in nature, this was a, a, a ritual of the pagan religions. And so when the temple of God was established, there were still high places, but those high places were devoted to pagan worship, and it was characteristic of the nations around Israel, so much so that the Lord, when he brought his children into the promised land, he warned them about this, and I want you to follow me to the book of um, Numbers 33, go to the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Numbers chapter 33, and verse 50. And I want you to see what the Lord had told his people as he was preparing to take them into the promised land. Numbers 33, beginning in verse 50, the Bible says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan, across from Jericho, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you have crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, destroy all their engraved stones, destroy all their molded images, and demolish all their what? Their high places. Now I'm going to continue reading, but I really want, when we read stuff like this, one of the bad habits we have is thinking it was way back then. And I want you as you read through this to ask yourself, what would this apply to today? They were going in among people who didn't worship the same God they worshipped, and therefore their customs and their practices were such that would be a negative influence on God's people. And God said, I want you to, I'm going to drive the people out. I don't want you to partake in their customs. Now we're continuing on. He says, I want you to drive out the inhabitants, destroy their engraved stones, destroy all their molded images, and demolish all their high places. Verse 53 says, You shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell in it, for I have given you the land to possess, and you shall divide the land by lot as an inheritance among all families, or your families. To the larger you shall give a larger inheritance, to the smaller you shall give a smaller inheritance. There's, there everyone's inheritance shall be whatever falls to him by lot. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. Verse 55, But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides, where they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. 
irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides. The Lord warned them about these practices and especially the, the high places. The high places were inroads to idolatry. That's what they were. And, and God said, if you allow these to remain, you can come in and say, hey, we're worshiping the true God and everything else. We don't worship their false gods, but if you allow these things to remain, they're going to be inroads for your people to soon be doing what they were doing. And in and, and, and other places, I believe in Deuteronomy and other places of Scripture, the Lord says it's going to come to the point where I'm going to have to drive you out of the land. They were snares to the people of God that kept one foot in the world, one step away from Christ. And I think it's important for us to understand that those things, those customs and cultures of the world that, that we allow into our lives come between us and Christ. Now people, I, I, get, I get this all the time from people talk about, oh, you're being nitpicky about do's and don'ts. Look, folks, you can't have something between you and Christ and talk about a relationship with Christ. Used to be, I remember some years ago, cars used to have what they called bench seats. You remember bench seats? The sporty cars had the bucket seats. But there was the bench seats, and I, I remember my older brother, boy, he, he got a, well, one of his, I think all of his first cars, because that's how they came, but it had the bench seats, but he liked the bench seats. You know why? You guys know why, right? You go out on a date, and what's, there's no fun like this. I've got a, a stick shift in the compartment here, and I can't, but with the bench seat, you can kind of cozy up while you're driving down the road, right? Some of you remember that, Okay? There's nothing in between. Now you get all that stuff in between. Folks, you can't have stuff in between you and Jesus and be close to him. Now, isn't that true? And the Lord is trying to tell this to his people. But the problem is, these things were allowed to remain, which we're going to see in a moment. I want you to notice this uh, statement from the book uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 544. It says, until the generation that had received instruction from Joshua. This is, this is right after Moses dies and then Joshua. Notice what happens after Joshua passes off the scene and we go into the time of the judges. Until the generation that had received instruction from Joshua became extinct, idolatry made little headway. But the parents had prepared the way for the what? The apostasy of the children. The disregard of the Lord's restrictions on the part of those who came in possession of Canaan. So seed of evil that continued to bring forth bitter fruit for many generations. Um, in, pa in fact, Pastor Danny and I were talking today, and I said, you know, we're going to be talking on revival. He says, well, the kids, are, you know, we've been working a lot with the kids. Kids are going to be gone. I said, I know. I want to talk to the parents today. I want to talk to, you know, sometimes we watch our kids and say, oh, they're getting revived. And hey, man, well, guess what? We need to be revived, too. I mentioned it, I think it was last week. You know, the kids have the memory verses that they memorize, and then we have memory verses we, we, we read. The Lord wants us to get closer to him, too. And, and it's interesting, I read this statement, that the parents had prepared the way. But sometimes we, here's the thing, sometimes we get to loving our life and the things in our life and our bad habits so much, and we just, I'll tell you, the way, I mean, here's the, the fanciest justifications for some of the things we do as Christians to make them sound Christian when really they're just evil habits that we try to keep in our lives and, and, and not realizing that we're putting a stumbling block there. Well, so were the, such were the high places, as we're going to see as we go on. Now, what's interesting to me is throughout the Scripture, there were many kings, good kings, the Bible calls them good kings, that had made many reform. They were just not, not, not just good kings, they were reformer kings. But there's something they didn't do. And I want you to follow me along very quickly here. We're going to go through a number of texts, starting with 1 Kings 15. This is not every text but it's just to give you an idea. An idea of what was happening with God's people. 1 Corinthians, 1 uh, Corinthians, 1 Kings, incidentally, it's Justina, she said there was no 2 Corinthians, she meant no 2 Corinthians 20, because uh, that's what was in the bulletin. We're in 1 Kings, chapter 15, and looking at verse 9, starting in verse 9, 1 Kings 15 and verse 9. The Bible says, in the twentieth year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king over Judah, and he reigned forty-one years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Maacah, the granddaughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was what? What was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David, and he banished the perverted persons from the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. Is that a good thing? Sure it is. Take some courage, right? 
He was a man of God. He's a faithful king, the Bible says. But look at the next. Uh, oh, verse 13. He, he, and he, also he removed Maacah, his grandmother, from being queen mother. There's a tough thing to do, huh? Because she had made an obscene image of Asherah, and Asa, uh, Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it by the brook Kidron, but, verse 14, the what? The high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. Now follow me to 1 Kings 22, verse 41. 1 Kings 22, just go a little bit to the right. 1 Kings 22 and verse 41. Notice what it says. 1 Kings 22, verse 41 says, Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, had become king over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shil Shilchai. And he walked in all the ways of his father Asa. He did not turn aside from them, doing what was? Doing what? What was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, what? The high places were not taken away, for the people offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. So here, while he's making certain reforms and doing good things, yet because he allowed the high places to remain, it, 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 it was an, a road, like I said, an inroad to idolatry, and the people would still go and worship at the high places. Now go to 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings now, chapter 12, verse 2. 2 Kings chapter 12 and verse 2. 2 Kings 12, verse 2, the Bible says, Jehoash did what was what? What was right in the sight of the Lord all the days which Jehoiada the priest instructed him, but the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Let's go to chapter 14, verse 1. Chapter 14, verse 1 says, In the second year of Joash, the king of Jehoahaz, the king of Israel, Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoadan, sorry, of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like his father David. He did everything as his father Joash had done. However, the high places were what? They weren't taken away, and the people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Now, what's happening? Let me ask you what's happening when after generation after generation after generation after generation the high places aren't taken away and the people keep worshiping at the high places. What is happening? It's becoming ingrained into the fabric of God's people. Right? It's becoming very deep-set tradition. Are you following that? Okay, uh, 2 Kings 15, chapter 15, verse 1. Again, 2 Kings 15, verse 1, In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, became king. He was 16 years old when he became king. He reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did what? Did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, except that the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Let's go to chapter 15, verse 32. 15, verse 32, the Bible says, In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, Jotham, the son of Isaiah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did what was? You almost know what it's going to say now. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Isaiah had done. However, the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and burned, incenses, burned incense at the high places. Now, I, I want to make a note again. All of these kings were what kind of kings? Were they good kings? Were they faithful kings? Sure they were. And yet, none of them touches the high places. Why? Why all the... And, and it's not that they weren't reformers. They, changed, they tore down this idol and did that. Well, I mean, uh, the one king tears down his grandmother's, takes her out of office, and burns her. So why were the high places left alone? You tell me. And don't look at me with that look like, I don't know. You're looking at me like, because you know what it is. Because the same reason we do it today. Oh, man, I'm not going to be the one to point that out. 
If I point that out, everybody's going to stone me, right? Come on, right? Why would a good king who's going to go make reforms say, ah, I'm not going there. I'm not going to the high places. I'm not going to tear down the high places. Because those are the things that we have come to love so much. And that's going to be the fireworks are going to be there at the, the high place. Yes or no? Folks, let me ask you a question that we ask a lot, but I want you to think about your answer. Do you believe Jesus Christ is coming soon? You think that the, this world is ready for him to come? Do you think this church is ready for him to come? I want you to be thinking about if that's it, I, okay, I heard a lot of no's. I'm going to ask it again. You think this church is ready for him to come? Okay, you think about what needs to happen then between now and then. Is the Lord going to reveal some things to us? I think he will. Now, the good news is that God had prophesied a change would come. We're going to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. 2 Chronicles 34. And we're going to look at one of the most powerful revivals ever in the history of God's people. 2 Chronicles 34, and starting in the first verse. 2 Chronicles 34, and, and what's almost the most amazing about this is the age of this king. When we start out, we're talking about Josiah. 2 Chronicles 34, verse 1. The Bible says Josiah was how old? Eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right or the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, so he was 16 years old, Right? He started when he was eight, and in the eighth year of his reign, when he was 16, it says, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to what? Purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places. Amen! Finally, somebody comes along who's willing to purge the high places. Yeah, at 16. He began, it says, it says, and we're going to see this, over, over the span of years, in his eighth year, while he was 16, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And I want to come back to that in a minute, but let me tell you something. When you begin to seek God with all your heart, you're going to start seeing things you didn't see before. And when it was when he was seeking the God of his father David that he began to see other things. We're going to, we're going to see that in the story, in the narrative. He began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, the molded images. They broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence and the incense altars, etc., etc. Now we're going to see that this, that there's a different timing for this that we'll pick up in the book of 2 Kings. But the point I want you to see is that when Josiah came to the throne, even at eight years old, he was one that had his heart committed to following the Lord. Now that, that, that should be a foregone conclusion, but you already notice that we start reading in in 2 Chronicles there, that it read different from everything else was, well, this king did good, he was followed in the ways of his father David, but, well, this king did good, but, well, this king, he tried it, but, but in this case, we don't get that, do we? Something different is happening. This young man started seeking the Lord with all his heart. In the book Prophets and Kings, page 384, it says, as one who was to occupy a position of trust, he resolved to obey the instruction that had been given for the guidance of Israel's rulers, and his obedience made it possible for God to use him as a vessel unto honor. And so we see a quite a different state of things with Josiah. Now this isn't the fascinating part of the story. This is not, we're not even there yet. I mean, already we see him kind of blazing ahead in being faithful to God, and then something happens. Then something happens. And I want you to go with me just a little bit further. Go to verse 14. There in 2 Chronicles chapter 34. Actually, I have to give you a little bit of a background here. If we look at verse 8, it says, In his, the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple. When he had what? Purged the land and the temple. He sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, Maaseiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, son of Jehoah, has the recorder to repair the house of the Lord his God. Now what happened is basically um, in the 18th year of his reign, he was about 26 years old, and he sent these men to collect offering money from Hilkiah the high priest in order to keep the work moving on repairing the temple. Evidently during the reign of his grandfather Manasseh, which we haven't gotten into all that, 
for sake of time, or his father Ammon, the temple had fallen into disrepair. And it needed to be fixed up. And so one of the things that Joash had set his heart to do was repair the temple of God. So he was having money taken to the men who were working and cleaning out the temple. And we're not talking about the sanctuary tent here. We're talking about Solomon's temple. You're talking about a very uh, a vast structure with lots of rooms and what have you. And I mean, I don't know if you've ever, ever had to clean out an attic or an old room or a warehouse or something like that. There's a lot going on there. And as they're cleaning out the temple, something interesting happens in verse 14. It says, Now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, right, to these men who came to collect it, Hilkiah the high priest, or Hilkiah the priest, found what? The book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. So Shaphan carried the book to the king, bringing the king word, saying, All that was committed to your servants they are doing. And they have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes, which was a sign of mourning. Now I, I want to back up again, and I want us to be on the same page here. Already we're looking at a man who, from what we've read, has been one of the most faithful kings that ever lived. And yet, when he reads the book of the law, which we understand to be portions of the Torah and large portions of Deuteronomy, that when he read that and saw what God said, he saw that his life wasn't in harmony with it. Okay? And, he, and, and not only his life, he was a leader of his people. And he saw his nation wasn't in harmony with it. Notice this statement. Finding the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Picture's worth a thousand words sometimes, isn't it? Josiah was deeply stirred as he heard read for the what? For the first time, the exhortations and warnings recorded in this ancient manuscript. Never before had he realized so fully the plainness with which God had set before Israel life and death blessing and cursing, and how repeatedly they had been urged to choose the way of life that they might become a praise in the earth, a blessing to all the nations. Now, I want to say something here, and I'd encourage you to read through that chapter in Prophets and Kings, but it, 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 in more of the quote, I have a little bit more of the quote still to go, but I, I, there's, there, there was more to it that I didn't put up there, basically saying that Josiah, when he saw these, basically the warnings of God and the judgments that God said would come on his people, he was moved with the love that God was showing to his people and even caring enough to give them the warnings. Now, why am I bringing that up? I, I, can't tell you how many time, I can't tell you how many times I read a certain portion of the Bible and people are like, oh, no, 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 that's not good. Let's talk about the love of God. Folks, the love of God is in the whole Bible. And it's interesting that sometimes we don't pick up. Josiah picked, one of the first things he picked up is how God has pled with his people over and over. Why does God give warnings and counsel to us? Why as a parent do you give warnings to your kids? I don't care. Go out and get hit by the car. No, you give warnings because you love them. And the divine spirit conveys that, and it was conveying that to Josiah, and he was moved by this. Notice what it goes on to say, and this is the first time he's ever heard some of these things. The book abounded in assurances of God's willingness to save to the uttermost those who should place their trust fully in him. As the king heard the inspired words, he recognized in the picture set before him conditions that were, notice, conditions that were similar to those actually existing in his kingdom. In other words, he is reading this ancient book and God's warning about don't go down this road or this road or this road and he says, lo and behold, 
We are down that road. We're smack in the middle of that road. We're at the end. We're at the destination of that road. Those things that God warned about are in my kingdom. And he tore his clothes in grief and repentance. And because God had forewarned, and God said if you go down this road, there's going to be judgments. We're not done yet. Notice what he does next. This, this is fascinating to me, and I think there's a huge lesson for us today. Verse 19 says that he tore his clothes. Verse 20 says, And the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Abdon the son of Micah, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah, a servant of the king, saying, notice, Go inquire of who? Of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in the book. So Hilkiah and those the king had appointed went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokath, the son of Hazra, keeper of the wardrobe. And they spoke to her, etc. So here the king reads, he hears the, the, the book of the law read to him, and then to get confirmation, he sends to the prophet of God. Just to get clarity on what am I supposed to do with this? How's this looking for us? And if you go and read the story, we're not going through the whole thing, Huldah, Huldah basically said this, all of these judgments are going to come upon the land of Israel because of how far they've gone in idolatry. There is nothing you can do at this point to turn away the judgments. There's a, ho there's a hope-filled message, right? The prophet always gives a hope-filled message. You think about that for a minute. There's no way around this. But because you, now think about it for a minute. I want you to put yourself in Josiah's place. Because you have set your heart to know and search the Lord and do his will, etc. And I'm paraphrasing here. This is not going to come in your lifetime. Now put yourself in Josiah's place. Okay, look. Israel has gone down the wrong road. I'm just finding, I'm reading the counsel of God and realizing we're not following half of this stuff. I send to the prophet of the Lord. The prophet says, hey, don't worry. There's going to come judgment because of it, but not in your lifetime. How hard was it going to be to deal with the high places that were so ingrained in the culture of God's people at this point? You think that's a little battle or a big battle? Now here you're just told, you're given the assurance, hey, it's not going to come in your lifetime anyway. What's the temptation? Whew, I'll let somebody else deal with that one. I'll let the next pastor who comes deal with that one. We joke about that as pastors sometimes. You're a pastor, you go, you, you get moved periodically, and it's like, no, I'll let the next pastor deal with that. I'll let the next guy deal with that. I'll let somebody else deal with it. But what's amazing is when Josiah is given the assurance from God that it's not going to come in your lifetime, the judgments are going to come, but you've, you know, because of your faithfulness, they're not going to come in your lifetime, he still goes about making the most challenging reforms that any king has ever made in Israel in the history of God's people. Because he, he sensed that there was still opportunity for repentance. Here, here's the thing. It doesn't matter. Judgments are going to come anyway. But listen, folks. Judgments can come when we have a lost relationship with Jesus, or judgments can come when we have a saved relationship with Jesus. And it's a lot better to have a saving relationship with Jesus than one that isn't a saving relationship. And Josiah realized that even though the judgments are coming, there's still possibility to help these people turn back to God so that when the judgments come, they know who to cling to. You guys are quiet today. So I want you to go to 2 Kings 23, 2 Kings 23, and let's look at what's, what uh, Josiah started to do. 2 Kings 23 and verse 1. I'm just going to read the first few verses here. And again, if time permitted, we could go into this a lot more, but you, 
give you something to read Sabbath afternoon or through the week. It's a fascinating story and one full of lessons. Chapter 23 of 2 Kings, verse 1, says, Now the king sent to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. Okay, this is after he finds the book of the law and after this comes to his attention and what have you. The king, verse 2, went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. Now, I, I got to pause here, and I was going to bring this up later, but I need to make this point. If there's nothing else that's made in here, this point needs to be made. Brothers and sisters, conviction comes to our hearts when we hear truth. It's awful hard to be convicted about something you don't know about. Right? It's impossible to be convicted about something you don't know about. And the fact of the matter is that oftentimes God's people were found in practices, idolatrous practices, not because they were intentionally doing it, but because they never knew any difference. There are all kinds of followers of Christ today, us included, sitting right here, who have more to learn about Jesus and his will for our life. And when we learn about his will, we're going to have choices to make, aren't we? It happens all the time. That's the Christian life. I praise the Lord that he doesn't lay everything on us at once and say, if you really want to follow me, this is going to be all of this stuff in your life is going to have to be, he gives us piece by piece by piece by piece, right? How many of you have been through that? The Lord convicts you of something and you wrestle with him and then by his grace you put that out of your life and you feel good and the Lord's like, okay, let's take the next step. The next step, step by step he leads us. The conviction came to Josiah when he saw the book of the law, when he heard the words. And it's interesting to me that the book of the law was first lost in the house of the Lord. Are we losing the book of the law in the house of the Lord today? In, in, in her day, Ellen White said that many of the ministers, in her words, she said, they take their text from St. Paul and their story from the headline. Their sermon from the headlines. And the fact of the matter is, we don't, we're not in the Word a lot. I talk to people about devotional time. They say, oh yeah, I'm doing a really good book for devotion. It's, you know, it's chicken soup for whoever's soul, you know. Okay. I ever think about the Bible? Maybe reading in the Bible. Could it be said that the book of law has been found, lost in the house of the Lord? We need to find it again. For Seventh-day Adventists, there are precious counsels that God's given us that many of us aren't even aware of. They're buried somewhere in the temple. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when we discover them. We're going to hear things, and we're going to look, and we're going to say, Wow! These things that God said were dangerous, we're doing half of them already, right now. Then what? This is where Josiah was. It's a little more close to home now, isn't it? Now suddenly not, we're not 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Folks, the devil repackages his tricks, and he uses them on generation after generation. The king had heard these words, and he knew the effect of hearing these words that would come on the people. And to be honest with you, when we had our manual session and we talked together as pastors, I knew what the effect would be when some of the students heard some of the words of the Lord that they were unacquainted with. That's just what happens. It's the living word of God, and it does something to stir the heart, and it brings things to mind. And Josiah realized this is going to have the same effect on my people as it's going to have on me. And so it says in chapter 23, verse 2, the king went up to the house of the Lord with the men of Judah and with all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. They all said, 
we're going to be faithful to obey God. I've got to interject, because I know there's somebody in here, some good Seventh-day Adventist, saying, that's the old covenant. They said, all the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. You go check Ellen White's writings. She comments on that, quotes that very thing. She says, all we will do and be obedient. And she said, this is the pledge we need to be making in these last days. Incidentally, she wrote that after 1888. So if you want to pull that one out of your hat. There was nothing wrong when the people of God said all that God has said we will do. The problem is they wanted to do it in their own strength. In fact, you go to Deuteronomy, you're not taking the time, you go to Deuteronomy 6, and it says there in Deuteronomy 6, they heard the words of the law, and, and God brought that back up to Moses. He said, I remember when the people came to me, and they said, all the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And the Lord says, they were right in all that they spoke. And then he says this, oh, that they had such a heart in them. Oh, that they had such a heart in them to love me and keep my commandments. It was a heart issue. When the people, of, these people, this was, a, this was a heart commitment to them. They heard those words and their love of the Lord said, I want to follow you, Lord. I want to be faithful to you. And they made a commitment with the king Josiah that day. And then Josiah went from that commitment. And the Bible says, verse 4, the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, the priest of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for what? Baal and Asherah. Folks, are you getting this? I, the first time I read this, I'm like, well, now wait a minute. We already read about this king, how he was faithful to God. He had purged Israel, right? He had already done this, and then he found the book of the law, and there's still stuff dedicated to Baal in the church? That should communicate us, to us how blind we can become to things. Even after the reforms of Josiah, now the Lord is really pushing them forward past these, what I would say, are the high places. And he talks about getting out the things of Baal and Asher. And I'm not going to read through the whole list. I want to jump ahead. And I want you to notice verse, um, verse 12. Not verse 12. There's my alarm. Yeah, verse 13. Then the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem, which were on the south of the Mount of Corruption, which who? Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, etc., etc. And verse 15 says, Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, had made. Both that altar and the high place he broke down. So here are just two notable high places. One built by Solomon, one built by Jeroboam. You know how old these things were? 300 years. 300 years these high places to foreign gods were among God's people. And even after the initial reforms of Josiah, they still remained. Now, finally, after centuries, they're torn down. I want you to think again what happens when something is there among you for centuries. It says in the book Prophets and Kings, in the Reformation that followed, the king turned his attention to the destruction of every vestige of idolatry that remained. I think we should turn our attention to every vestige of idolatry that remains in our life, in our church, in our community. But the painstaking reform resulted in the greatest spiritual blessing this side of the cross. He followed with a Passover, and I'm just going to read a couple verses in 2 Kings 23. Verse 22, the Bible says, Such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. Jump to verse 25. Now before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with what? All his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. That's why he tore down those high places. Why? The Bible tells us why. 
because he was full, more fully committed to the Lord than any had been. A full commitment to the Lord. You can't get that close to God when there's something in between you and him on that seat. You understand what I'm saying? And so the Bible lays out this story for our admonition. For this generation where we say, I believe we're going to see the Lord come. Are there high places that need to be torn down? Let me list a few for you. You ready for this? We're friends, right? We're friends, right? Oh, no, it depends what you're going to put up. Let's list them, okay? I tricked you. I'm not going to list them. Now, listen to me. I'm telling you right now, listen to me carefully. Even before I went to that slide, there are things in your head right now that you're like, he's going to put up this, he's going to put up that, he's going to put up that. And I just want to tell you, I didn't tell you. So already things are coming to your mind that the Spirit of God told you because you already know what kind of things we have among us that shouldn't be there. See, if I said it, you're going to say, that pastor, I disagree with him. Well, guess what? You can't disagree with me now. Because the Spirit of God is telling you, the question is, what are we going to do about it? Now, there may come a day later on where I list some things part of my job as a minister, but I'm not going to do it today. I don't think I need to today. We have got to ask ourselves what we're allowing in our lives and in our church and in our community that is getting between us and Christ. I don't care if it's 200, 300 years old, but we don't have 300 years in the Abbas Church. I want to review some key lessons from this in closing. Number one, lesson we learned. Josiah was a good king, but he still needed reform. A lot of times we talk about revival and reformation, and some members get up in arms, we get all defensive. I had students this week get a little upset and defensive. Folks, you know, when we say, yeah, I believe I'm a sinner, you know what that already presupposes? It presupposes you're doing things wrong, they're probably going to have to be changed. Isn't that right? It's for every one of us. Just because he was a good king didn't mean there weren't changes that need to be made. Just because you might hear in a sermon or something pointed out, or you might read something in the counsel of God that says you need a change isn't calling you a bad person. is isn't saying you're not being faithful to God. It's saying you're walking with God. And he's going to keep teaching you. Lesson number two, the book of the law was discovered in the house of the Lord. Church folks still need reform. Right? It was in the house of the Lord. We're going to discover, by God's grace, we discover some of the book of the law every time we come together in the house of the Lord. And we're challenged by the Spirit of God. Lesson, oh, check this out. Testimonies of Ministers, page 30. says, we have what? A few lessons? Many lessons to learn and many, many to unlearn. God and heaven alone are infallible. Those who think they will never have to give up a cherished view, never have occasion to change an opinion, will be disappointed. Isn't that true? Lesson number three, it was the book that awakened Josiah's conscience. Sometimes we avoid books because we're afraid that we're going to read it and it's going to tell me something and then I'm going to know it and I'm going to have to do something. But there's something also called neglect of truth. I knew a doctor, I knew a Seventh-day Adventist doctor in my first church. We were talking together about health reform. And I said, you read that in Councils and Diet and Foods. She said, no, I've never read Councils and Diet and Foods. I said, you've never, you're a doctor and you've never read? I don't want to read. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes we avoid things. I know, look, folks, I know all the arguments. Oh, it's a compilation. Fine, go read Councils on Health. No, we avoid sometimes. We tend to avoid the things that we know might tell us. How, do you really want to get closer to Jesus? I had a friend of mine who, who was counseling with a woman who, she said, I, I feel like, I need help with my kids, and I want to be a better mother, and I want to be a better parent, and can you suggest some resources? My friend said, have you ever tried the book Child Guidance? This was an Adventist woman, and she said, no, 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 not Child Guidance. He said, why not? She said, it makes me feel like I'm a bad mother. I thought that's why you wanted the book. How is it worded in Christ Optic Lessons again? There's a, there's a, a soul, there's a, Something like there's a soul poverty that the tongue can confess, but the heart doesn't recognize. We can say, oh, we can say I'm a sinner, I need a savior. Do we really mean it? Do we really need Jesus? Do we really want Jesus? Do we really... It's the book that awakens Josiah's conscience. I want to encourage you to be in the book. 
Number four, he inquired of the prophetess about the book. That's biblical. Okay? He says, oh, I don't, the spirit of prophecy, no, I'm not going to read Ellen White's prophecy. I'm going to go to the, I'm just going to go to the Bible. You know what the Bible just told us? In the Bible, he went to the prophet to find out about the book. Notice Ellen White makes a powerful statement in early writing 78. She says, I recommend to you, dear reader, the what? The book, right? The word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. By that word, we are to be judged. Now notice this. God has in that word promised to give visions in the last days, hasn't he? It's the Bible who tells us that God's last day church is going to have the gift of prophecy. Notice, not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of his people and to correct those who err from Bible truth. There's a lot of times we think we're doing the right thing when we're not. And when you go to the prophet, and the prophet clarifies the application. Thus says God dealt with Peter when he was about to send him to preach the Gentiles. You go back to the story in Acts 10. God used the prophetic gift to clarify some things for Peter there. Number five, Josiah set his heart to obey the book. It's great to hear about it. Have our hearts stirred. I'd ask again, why are you a Christian? Are you a Christian because you want to follow Christ? Then commit yourself to following Christ. Commit yourself to following Christ. He set his heart to obey the book. Number six, even after assurance that he would escape judgment, Josiah still went forward with the toughest reforms in the history of God's people. The reality is, because he committed himself to the Lord, he couldn't have done otherwise. Notice this statement. We're moving upstream here. To some extent, the Bible has been introduced into our schools and some efforts have been made in the direction of reform. But it is most difficult to adopt right principles after having been so long accustomed to popular methods. The first attempts to change the old customs brought severe trials upon those who would walk in the way which God has pointed out. Now this goes for all of us, but I'm putting this in the context. The principal got up and made a speech this week that warmed my heart. And he told the whole student body, my conscience is telling me to do this. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We know the final test is going to be a test over conscience. If there's one thing we don't want to do, it's force somebody against their conscience. And I praise the Lord that he got up and wanted to follow his conscience in a way that wasn't easy. We're all going to have to do that, aren't we? If we're going to be faithful to Jesus. Notice, and, and, it, and it's these, these old high places we run into. The, to the unconverted who view matters from the lowlands of human selfishness, unbelief, and indifference, right principles and methods have appeared wrong. And you can read on more of that. Sometimes we see things the way we think it's right, and uh, we need a new look. Finally, number seven, revival can't fully come while the high places, places remain. Satan knows it, and so should we. Folks, Satan doesn't care if we make half reforms as long as he has a place at the table. Okay? That's why, that's why they had the most powerful... Passover, because they got those things out of the way that were between them and the Lord. And the revival we want and pray for is not going to come a high places remain. Notice this, there is nothing that Satan fears so much. See, that's Satan's nightmare. This is, his, this is what he has nightmares about. He has nightmares about us getting serious with God. There is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. If Satan had his way, there would never be another awakening, great or small, to the end of time. It's time to tear down the high places, folks. It's time to tear down the high places in our own personal lives. And I want to appeal to you today. The Spirit of God has spoken to you. You've got things going around in your mind. You might be upset about them. You might think, well, I just don't like what the preacher said. You go home and you think about it, and you think about whether it's something I said or whether you got from the Spirit of God. And ask yourself, ask yourself, and be honest with yourself, if there's something in my life that is coming between me and the Lord, and I know it. One of the things we did is we challenged the students during our army of youth, that if there's something in between them and the Lord, they come and they burn that thing. We had students do it. We had staff do it. I had to go home and make some th get some things out of my life. I'm going to challenge you today. If you love the Lord Jesus, why are you letting something in between you and him? Get it out. It's time for the high places to be gone. I don't care how long it's been there. I don't care how rooted it is in your tradition, your family's tradition, and the school's tradition, and the church's tradition, and whatever. If it's between us and the Lord, it's time for it to go. 
Be earnest with the Lord. Honor God and God will honor us. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Father, as we've meditated over this history of your people, Father, centuries of history, we see in it a call to us to total consecration and faithfulness. And Lord, your Spirit will speak to each one of us today in different ways because we all struggle with different things. But we all need to draw closer to Jesus. Father, you reveal these things. It's your voice calling us to yourself. And I pray that as we've heard these words today, as we meditate upon these things, as we look at this sacred history, I pray that our hearts would be moved to take a stand as the people did in Josiah's day. To take a stand to follow you and be faithful to you. To be faithful to the counsels you've given us. That there would be nothing between us and you, but that we would be wholly yours. For we ask and pray this today in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen.